on earth wouldn't young people want to go to church? Right? The question popped up in my Twitter feed. Because, you know, I'm one of those cool people who use Twitter, right? And, yeah, you knew that. And uh, it popped up there, and it was being asked by one of the more traditional strict Baptist pastors of my early acquaintance. I haven't really heard from him in years, but he's still in the UK somewhere, I think. He used to know him well once. You know, this little thing. Um, I was glad of his post. Uh, it, it got me thinking. Then my young people, why would anybody want to go to church? Why would anybody want to do that? I mean, my own real experience of church as a believer, right? and, and having a bit of background, so I know what sort of questions to ask yourself whether I'm going to go for that one or not. My own experience of going to church is not great. Quite often. Why would anybody want to go to church? Churches are not usually very hospitable or enjoyable or refreshing places to go. Now think about this. When did you or I last think that going to church was going to be a good thing to do? Thank you. That's the answer I needed. <laughs> I was going to say next. <laughs> when did you last think coming to this church would be a good thing to do? And you just said already. <laughs> Thank you. You're going to have a biscuit. You're going to have a biscuit. Don't you biscuits, right? <laughs> Put it another way, when did you or I last think that this church might be a good place to invite somebody to come? Thinking that they might be okay with that too. It's a slightly different question, I hope it wasn't a cunning one. <laughs> but what actually are the reasons for that? that people don't think is a good place to come. That maybe we think, they will think, is a good place. Okay, the preacher's rubbish, right? We know that, yeah? We can live with that, but what else? See, I think Paul is teaching us stuff here today that might really help us. Paul is describing the characteristics of the church meeting in Philemon's own house in the city of Colossae in about 60 AD. Describing a setting that has different priorities and different characteristics all together from by far the majority of churches in Wales today, this day, this Sunday. Perhaps including us? Don't know. Let's see. So we look at this tiny, rather unusual New Testament letter, Paul's letter to Philemon, trying to work out what lies in and through the Philemon shaped window that Paul is opening for us on the early church, okay? What was that program? Children's program on the telly. Let's look through the round window. What was that program? Play school. Play school! There we are. So today, Paul opens the Philemon shaped window for us on the church, the early church, and why it was a great place to go and be part of. And keep going again. We learned last time the emphasis in Paul's letter to this house church located in Colossae. The emphasis on apostolic teams taking forward the kingdom of God. The emphasis on seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, which gets you in trouble with the authorities, persecuted. That was a characteristic of it. Shared ministry, because the apostolic team was like a rolling rock. It wasn't like a hierarchical structure. It was like everybody piles in and then the flat peels off the side. You know what I mean? Get the analogy? The men do. Scarlet's email last night. Scarlet, <laughs> you, can't say, you can't say things like that anymore, Mike. They're, they're a rugby supporter, maybe we get up in arms about it. Um, Scarlet's in really well. Um, but, but it's that peeling away, you know, there's the come in and train with and alongside the apostolic team and peel off the edges. What a great place, what a constructive, what an empowering place to be. Shared ministry. Meeting in homes. We did this last week. But it's, isn't it so much easier to say, come to our house, we're having some friends around, we're going to sing a bit, we'll have some food. Isn't it easier to say that, would you like to come to the old people's hall? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I mean, it's a no brainer, isn't it? They were meeting in homes. You could say, go to Philemon's house, that big house up the hill, we're going up there today, come in, do you want to come? Oh, you'll be fine about it, come on. I don't know, what are we doing? It was the third century before the church started owning property to meet in. Where was I going with this? 
back to last week's sermon like a bad dream. Um, apostolic teams, persecution, taking it, getting on with it, shared ministry, meeting in homes, and being conditioned by, if not saturated with grace. Saturated with grace. Controlling our responses to people, controlling the way we relate to people, controlling what we do as people, and accepting gracious community, not judging. See, it's warm, it's homely, it's welcoming, it's inclusive, it's hospitable. And fall to the top there with Jesus. Grace is in the place. Okay, now, <clears throat> that was last week. Now stop, Simon. Right. Take the last week's insights a little bit further along to verses 4 through 7 now. And, and Paul opens a different window in the same wall. A, a Paul-shaped window. A window on his own heart as a Christian leader elsewhere for this fellow believer who Paul seems to have led to the Lord. Right? We'll get to that later mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Living in a place Paul hasn't visited. It's not Paul's ministry, it's his. Epaphras has been up there and done the, done the Bible preaching bit and planted the church, but the, the church is meeting in Philemon's home. Philemon's not the Bible teacher. Philemon is the host of the church. He's the refresher of the saints. There's a really So Paul then lays bare his joy in Philemon, what he rejoices about in Philemon. And he lays plain, the, on an open verse, the things he appreciates in the guy. And then he lays bare his prayers for Philemon and what it is that motivates Paul to pray these prayers. He's giving us a window on his heart as a Christian leader, what he appreciates in that church. Great expose of what Paul values in another believer. And you know something? Nowhere, nowhere in that list does it say cool, or learned, or famous. Jesus isn't going to stand there on the last day and say, well done, good and famous servant, is he? Nor cool servant, nor terribly erudite servant, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy. Good and faithful servant. In Philemon's case, faithful in ways we so often don't appreciate. So when we hear Paul praying here, we gain a better understanding of spiritual characteristics that were valued amongst the earliest followers of Christ. And what we do with that better understanding of what's good and what is to be aspired to is we learn that that's what's to be aspired to. And we reform our understanding of what's good and to be aspired to according to a biblical pattern. Yeah? Firstly, what does Paul pray for Philemon, verse 4? I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. What does Paul do first of all? See, Paul turns to prayer, right? He turns to, to prayer for Philemon, and before he can get to prayer, he runs into this solid wall of thanksgiving. Because he thinks about the guy, he goes, oh, God, it's marvelous, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Philemon. Good two things that he hears about, two things that characterize Philemon, the Greek is singular, it's about you in the singular, you Philemon. These two things stimulated Paul's thankfulness about Philemon. Love for all God's people, first. Faith in the Lord Jesus, second. Surely Paul's made a mistake there. Well, here's a question. What goes through your mind when you think of this church, when you think of your brothers and sisters here, the leaders in this, and other churches? Because the challenge from Paul's prayer for each one of us, isn't it, has got to be this, are you thankful? That question we asked earlier on, you know, about why would anybody want to come here, if you're not thankful for your brothers and sisters who meet with you here, then that's going to show. It's going to show to them. If you're thankful for your brothers and sisters who you meet with when you come to this church here, then there's a chance you might be able to bring others here, just a chance. It's hard enough, that's not made it more difficult. <laughs> if you don't like it here, you won't do that. Is that a fair conclusion to draw? So when Paul turns to Philemon to pray for him, it is not anxiety that rises up in, in the preacher's heart.
There are many other pastors out that bring anxiety out. You know, you talk to pastors around the place, you know, late in the day when too much coffee's been drunk or something, and uh, you talk about it and they're anxious for their people. They're anxious for individuals. They're concerned as to what's happening. There are many pastors woke up this morning and turned to pray, perhaps for particular people in the congregation, and felt the furrow spreading across their brow. It's not that they don't love them. That they do love them. But that person has allowed things or thoughts into their lives that aren't good, and that means your first thought in prayer is not thanksgiving. It's not thanksgiving. They've waited their hearts to some sin. They've not fed their souls. They've neglected the means of God's grace. They've made priorities of things that are trivial, so they brought uselessness into their lives. And the fellow spreads across the God's brows. Paul's prayers turn to Philemon and a smile spreads across his face. Okay. That's a different, uh, that's a different situation, isn't it? I pray thankfully for Philemon. It's not just that he likes Philemon. It's not that they're natural friends and companions. He's not some impressionistic emotional attachment. Paul's thankful appreciation of Philemon comes for some real, practical, concrete reasons. Because... There is a reason. You can draw the equation, right? There it is. There's facts for it. There's stuff about Philemon that Paul gives thanks to God about as soon as he turns to prayer. It's not because he ought to. It's not because he wants to sound appreciative and life gets worse for pastors if we don't sound appreciative. It's true. But it's not that. He can point out there are reasons that his efforts at praying for Philemon just run to this intervening wall of spontaneous thanksgiving. And those reasons are going to be important. He prays thankfully for Philemon because of Philemon's love for all God's holy people. Philemon loves all God's people. Who would have thought that would be such a big thing? Great preacher, I'd have gone for that one. Definitely. Big giver. Some days that one might seem appealing as well. Great worship leader, dynamic evangelist. I'm back to cool again. Very cool person, very popular with the youth group. Paul picks out something far more significant. Philemon really loves God's own people. Why is that so significant? Why is that so important? Do you know, most people cannot believe that God loves them. Can't believe it. They just don't get it if you tell them God likes them. Most people certainly can't believe God likes them, so they think we're fantasizing when we say God loves them. You may even have come in here this morning, you know, it happens a lot, even as a believer in the Lord Jesus, convinced of your own sinfulness, quite right, humbled by this week's failures, absolutely, and you come in to sit with us, we all can come in here very easily, we sit there slightly guilty, slightly crushed, slightly cold. Yeah. True, it's all true. But I was right the first time, you know, it is astonishing, but God does like you more than that. God passionately loves you with all that. Sounds like crap going on, I don't know say that. With all that stuff, He loves you. And you find it hard to accept that. How about somebody on the outside who hasn't had your experience of God? Until somebody shares it with them. Until somebody who knows the love of God can show some of God's love to them. Philemon, your love for all God's holy people is most significant. How does Jesus say will people know, encounter the reality that we're actually a disciple of Jesus? It will be real to those people if we have love for one another, says John 13, 34 to 35. But this will all men know, you're my disciples. 
if you read the latest book and know how to evangelize them very effectively, if you're bang on top of all the apologetics that's coming, if you have love for one another, he's talking to his followers. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Why would people want to go to church if they thought it wasn't for real? An awful lot of them, you know, truly, truly believe this stuff we do today is they, they fantasy. Unless somebody shows them how real it is. How will it show them it's real, says Jesus? By the love you have for one another. So when Paul prays for Philemon, it is the God-honouring reality of this Christian man that Paul gives thanks for. It's the reality that puts flesh on the bones and proves to a watching world this isn't fantasy. It's the love you've got for God's holy people. Here's how the genuineness of Christianity drives out the false charge thrown at us that we are fantasists. Oh, hallelujah, says Paul. Philemon loves all God's set-apart people. Who wouldn't be thankful praying for Philemon? Yeah? The love for all God's people. And the second thing, second thing, can't get over that. Can't get over, this is the second thing. Your faith in the Lord Jesus. Your love for all God's people is more significant, says Paul. First of all, I give thanks because of your love for all God's people. Because that, that, that proves it ain't fantasy. about why. Why would that be? When something odd comes up in the Bible, there's usually a reason for it. Never think about why. You find it easy loving people. Do you find it easy loving Christian people? Some Christian people are really annoying. <laughs> so you share that with you. I can I can be, you know, really annoying. Did you know that? Okay. Um, well I can, let me tell you. And um, it can be really hard to love God's people. They ain't nice. That's why they're there. They're there because they're sinners, you know? And all of a sudden it's in the open. And you're trying to live together as a community, a loving community with the people of God. And, and you know, you're up against each other all the time. It's right in your face. Oh, I know you, man. Loving folks is a risky old business. It goes wrong, it can get expensive. And it's often a very thankless task. That's the worst thing, isn't it? It's such a thankless task. There'll be times when it seems fruitless, thankless, unprofitable. Sadly, it often seems not really worthwhile to persevere with loving this person. Which is where trusting the Lord Jesus and carrying on faithfully gets absolutely crucial. We don't end up being the church we should be, one that accurately represents Jesus by loving the people that love us. And giving up unless everything goes swimmingly. We end up being the church that we should be, one that accurately represents Jesus by loving the people he calls us to and persisting faithfully when the results are not quite everything we were hoping for. Quite often that's the way. It was the way for him with us. <coughs> and it's going to be the way for us as well. Is that, is that, did the maths work out there? Love and then faith to persist in it when it seems humanly unreasonable to do so. And let's face it, that was happening in Philemon's own house. <laughs> More difficult to take, perhaps. But think about those people who, you know, why wouldn't they want to go to church on Sunday? People long that God's grace should be represented to them like that. The way he's represented it to us. That's the sort of church you can bring your friends to. <coughs> Paul thanks God for Philemon. Because those are the characteristics that his leadership stamps on that congregation. Okay, so those are the things that give rise then to this thankful tenor of Paul's prayer. <laughs>